Hey folks, I'm Chris and I'm your Commander Mechanic here with a special episode. We've recently crossed 2,500 subscribers on the channel and I can hardly believe it. I wanted to do something special for you, so I've put together a Q&A with not only me, but one of the faces behind the scenes of the channel. We'll get to that in a minute, but if I'm gonna be open and honest, time for a change of costume. Hey, Sean, welcome, hey. welcome to In Front of the Camera. Thanks, Chris, it's a pleasure to be on this side of the production. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think everybody watching knows who I am at this point, but, uh, but you're a new face to the channel, even though everybody has seen kind of your handiwork for the past few months. Why don't you let everybody know who you are? Yeah, that's right. So my name's Sean. I am the audio engineer here for Commander Mechanic. That means what I do is I take care of all of the music, so the original scores in all of the episodes, as well as my job is to make you sound good. And you do a great job of it, let me just say. <laughs> I think everybody else can say that uh, that you've been doing a man magnificent job the past few months. Uh, Thanks. So, I, I, I'm really proud of the work we do here. And I, I think it shows the, with what we've been able to turn out for the past few months. Uh, I think we can all be pretty happy with that. But one of the reasons why you and I are kind of in our plain clothes here in front of the camera is that we've crossed a milestone, 2,500 subscribers on the that channel. Have. Can, can you believe that? In an insanely short time. Yeah, in a little over three months, we've hit 2,500 subscribers on the channel. I'm floored. It, it's I'm mind blowing. Floored. It, it really is. And uh, I think that we wanted to take a moment and thank everybody who subscribes to the channel, everybody who's found us, and everybody who's helped us get to this stage by giving you a little bit of a peek of us when we aren't, uh, you know, stage ready kind of thing. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Um, uh, so, and it's. Go ahead. Well, so for the for the past few weeks, we've been collecting questions from the audience. Uh, That's right. Because they want to know a little bit more about us. They're really eager to see you, the other face that works on the channel. Uh, and they want to know a little bit more about us. So via Twitter and Patreon and through YouTube, we've been collecting some questions. And we've got a yeah. good dozen little questions here that we're going to answer so that you can get an insight into who works on the channel. Yeah. All right. So let's hop right in. I think the, the one that stood out to me in the questions we've been collecting, um, I think we should just get it out of the way right up ahead. Yeah. Um, Chris, are you a real mechanic? <laughs> so th this is the number one question that we've received throughout the lifetime of the channel. Am I a real mechanic? Uh, and sorry to ruin the illusion, but no, I'm not a real mechanic. I'm not an auto mechanic. I'm not an aviation mechanic. I am a commander mechanic. Uh, and all of, all of the tune-ups that I do and I'm capable of doing are on magic decks and, and commander decks. Uh, one of the things that I know best is, of course, magic. So unfortunately, while I might look the part with the cap and the coveralls, uh, no, I'm not a real mechanic. Sorry to ruin the illusion. <laughs> but on that note, uh, maybe you can let the uh, folks who maybe have missed out on the uh, doobers where you let let them in on that peek behind the curtain. What is it you do um, if you're not fixing up cars or decks? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, I, I do have a day job. Uh, the the channel is a kind of a, a hobby here for us. Uh, but I'm I'm in marketing full time. I manage a marketing firm uh, doing digital marketing. So it's uh, it's kind of in my wheelhouse what we do outside of the actual magic part of this. <laughs> exactly. And I'm actually coming from an industry background myself, relevant here. Um, I spent the past six years in the audio industry, working in various parts of film, uh, live audio production and music. Um, so I bring that to the channel for my day job. Yeah, and that fits perfectly with what we want to do here on the channel, your production background. That really puts a level of polish on what we do. And you would not believe out of everybody that we've talked to over the past few seasons of Let's Do a Brew, how many people either have an industry background in production already mm -hmm. or are looking for an industry trained uh, background in production, somebody with an, an industry background in production. So uh, again, I think uh, what we do here, you're perfectly suited for it. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and I think the best example of that is the guys over at Game Nights. 
um, with their uh, TV and film backgrounds. Yeah. Uh, kind of set the uh, set the stage for the space in terms of uh, what the audience is expecting out of EDH content. So yeah, uh, but- I know when you and I are in the early days, uh, one of the talks we were having before we launched the first episode was how are we going to make our impression in the space? And production value is always a top priority. Yeah. And while we might not have a full film or television production crew or the resources for it, like the Command Zone and Game Nights do, uh, we still want to strive to be a cut above. Uh, While we are in our rooms doing this on the equipment that we have, we still want it to sound professional. So I think that we managed to do that. Exactly. And I think it might be worthwhile to uh, let the folks at home know, uh, how is it that we actually cross paths in the first place? <laughs> and this is a question that uh, that we get a lot too. How, how, did we, uh, how did we get together and how did we start this channel? Uh, people mm-hmm. have known that I'm not the only one that's on the channel for a while now, and they've been eager to get to know you a little bit too. Uh, and yeah. w- one of the questions is, how did we meet? Uh, and uh, we we met through a mutual friend, uh, and magic was just kind of on the fringes when we first met. Uh, it's something that you had done years ago, and we're just getting back into, just sinking exactly. your teeth into. And uh, me, with my passion for magic, uh, I really kind of sunk my claws into you and dragged you back into magic. Uh, I know Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> you you were an avid kitchen table magic player. That's uh, right. And uh, I think me as the bad influence, I kind of dragged you into both modern and EDH. Uh, and that is I, correct. <laughs> I apologize to your wallet. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's actually, it's one of those infections that has had much positive effects. Um, with your bad influence, I actually started dragging my girlfriend uh, into EDH and uh, we're getting into Pioneer together actually there you go um, it, it, but yeah Chris was uh, you were the I am running my upgraded version of what you gave me the shell of Merfolk in modern yeah which is still my favorite uh, way to play the format um, and the first brew I did in Commander for our playgroup uh, we had a bit of a budget Commander to get the whole playgroup into it uh, I think I stole one of your old lists for uh, a Zuri Claw of Progress. And uh, we're going to let you in on a little early days secret of the channel here. <laughs> Episode four um, was actually that very deck list. Yes. Um, yeah, that, that was your submission for episode four on the channel was your Azuri list and looking to get some input and some feedback on that. So uh, that's a, that's a, an interesting segue to our next question here is uh, why did we start the channel? Uh, yeah. And it's it's partly because of the play group that we were playing with for Commander exactly. uh, is that uh, everybody was just getting into Commander. You started with Kitchen Table Magic mm-hmm. uh, and I've been an enfranchised Magic player since the Ice Age days at this point. Oh. So... Uh, yeah, I hate to reveal my age to everybody out there, but uh, yes, I started back in Ice Age. Uh, and uh, when I kind of dragged you and some of our friends into EDH, uh, I really became a nexus for feedback on the brews exactly. that everybody was doing. And previously, we would do a Magic Day once a month mm-hmm. where close to 10 of us would get together and jam Commander all day long. And people would bring to me, hey, here's the next deck list that I want to build. Here's what I want to do. What do you think? And we used to be able to do that in person. Uh, We would sit down across from the table, uh, across the table from each other, rather, and I would give input and feedback and advice. But with everything going on in the world this year, we haven't been able to do that. And the channel was kind of born out of continuing that tradition. Uh, of exactly. giving feedback and input and working together on building deck lists. Uh, the moment that one of our friends asked me remotely to give input on a list and I couldn't sit down and look him in the eye and give him feedback is when I made the first video on the channel, which was our Netheroy Apex of Death list. Uh, and kind of that turned into the pilot episode 
for the yeah, channel. Exactly. Uh, and that's when you and I joined forces and actually put a veneer of production on it and uh, decided yeah, and, to ship it for everyone. Yeah, joined forces is a really uh, diplomatic way of saying it. I'm fairly certain I forced my way into this project here. Um, you had, I, if I recall correctly, uh, we have a group chat for our magic group, and you had posted the uh, the pilot as you cut it, um, and just looking for some feedback. And I DM'd you and said, "Hey, um, I think I could bring something to the table on that," and <laughs> just kind of forced my way into this project. And I'm I'm really glad that we. Uh, that we ran with it. And yeah, it's kind of funny. It took a, I, I know this had been something you had been kind of ideating on for a while and kind of uh, thinking on making, but it took a pandemic to actually kick it into gear and really uh, it became less of a want to do project and more of a need to do project. Right, because right. It reached the point where, you know, you got to keep the hands busy when you're going stir crazy, locked inside in quarantine. And this really mm -hmm. became a project for me. And I'm glad that you've been on board along the way. When I cut that first trailer that I shared with you and you said, this is something that I want to be a part of, uh, I was just learning video editing. That was actually yeah. the first thing that I had ever edited, the first video I had ever edited. And the version that has gone up on the channel, which is now one of our most watched videos on the channel, yep. is still one of the first videos I've ever cut. Uh, and mm -hmm. it's crazy to think that now, four months from where we started, the level of improvement that making at least two videos a week has shown in the style of editing, in the audio editing as well, we're really falling Absolutely. into a nice routine here. And yeah. again, I think, and I think everybody watching thinks that we're creating something that's pretty cool. Yeah, and I would say that's a good transition into just uh, for anyone out there watching who has toyed with the idea of getting into making EDH content, whether that's gameplay or deck text, or even just like talking about the format and uh, what it means to you. Um, I think that one of the best advice that we can give you, even though we had a little bit of skills coming into this, um, 20 tune-ups later, and you can see the difference that just practice yeah. twice a week really uh, forces you to get good on your craft. <laughs> I know that, um, again, I'm coming in with six years of audio editing, but um, my processes have, has, have improved exponentially having to fit this in between life, work, playing magic myself, yeah. and everything else. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so to anyone out there who wants to get into the content creation community, just cut a video, see if any of your friends might have some relevant skills, and then just commit to putting those videos out, and eventually you yeah. will find your, uh, your niche like we have. We've got a great audience here. I... I spent a lot of time on YouTube as a as a viewer, and the comment section that we have is probably one of the most constructive and positive spaces that yeah. I've ever had, and it just warms my heart um, that we've kind of put this little community together. Yeah, I, I was joking with one of our guests on Let's Do a Brew, where you know we're four months in, and I'm still waiting for that really vitriolic comment. Uh, that's on one of our videos because we haven't had it yet. Nobody's been yeah. like, this is trash. This is garbage. You don't know what you're doing. Everybody's like, oh, I'd make this decision or hey, check out my list. And it's been really great and really productive. And uh, again, I think it goes to show that the EDH community as a whole is a really welcoming, warm place when you really get into it. Absolutely. And, the, um, and, and just to that point, um, I, I definitely check once a week just to scroll through all of our video comments just to see if we missed it somewhere. But yeah, it's uh, it's an excellent community. I'm glad to be a part of it. Yeah, we're, we're waiting for it. One day it'll come. Uh, and and I'm, I'm hoping that y'all aren't taking this as a, a cue to, to yeah go into the comments and start uh, spewing uh, the, those vitriolic comments now. Uh, we love all of you. Keep that in mind. <laughs> exactly. All right. Um, so, so yeah, for going back to Ice Age. Yeah. Um, oh, so <laughs> you've been in this for so long, it might be hard to think about um, what life was like before Magic, but have we got a... Uh, why did you pick up that first pack of that? I guess back in the time, they would have had those... Um, those starter yeah. decks that were actually good. <laughs> yeah, and, and that was actually one of my first Magic products was an Ice Age starter deck. 
Uh, and they were just the tiny little package boxes that were semi-random assortments of cards. And the moment that I first cast a Volcanic Geyser for nice. Lethal uh, is the moment I knew that I was hooked on magic. Yeah. Uh, just the the, uh, the nature of it and the flavor of it and that I was literally burning out my opponent with, uh, with Molten Magma was uh was a moment where i knew that magic was going to be a hobby for me and you know like most players i've been off and on with mm -hmm. magic uh, i've played off and on seriously and not seriously i've been a tournament grinder before uh and when edh started it really became a favored format for me i uh, i was a standard player uh up through Cons of Tarkir, Fate Reforged, oh, Dragons right. of Tarkir. Uh, and then I made the switch to Modern. Uh, and I started playing Merfolk in Modern, which is how I got you into it. Uh, and yep. then I switched over to Eldrazi and Eldrazi Winter. Uh, and now I'm playing Eldrazi Tron. Uh, sorry, please, again, no hate in the comments <laughs> below. Uh, but since, uh, since not a lot of Modern tournaments are happening... Uh, mm -hmm. I think it's just been reinforced that EDH is my favored format uh, moving yeah. forward. And, and it, it always has been. I, I've said it before. I mean, certain people have seen me on Let's Do a Bruce say, I love making Rube Goldberg machines where, you know, one thing leads to another, does another. And by the end of it, you get some weird effect and something happens. And you get to assemble these, you know, 10 piece combos that do something exactly. crazy or they generate amazing value where your opponent does something and you get three triggers from it. And you know, those, those kind of interactions, those kind of things aren't something that happens when you're in like a turn three format, like in modern, which is exactly. to say that I, I, I still like faster formats. I still like modern uh, and I, I love higher power level EDH as well. Mm -hmm. uh, I've got a few staple EDH decks that I keep going back to when I want a higher power level. And I've got a play, play group that doesn't include you and some of our friends mm -hmm. that plays at the competitive le level regularly. And it's nice to get that level of pace and interaction and counterplay that yeah. uh, I, I think really is a tenant that I bring to deck construction uh, at mm -hmm. all power levels as well. Just the, the tenants of value and counterplay and skill floor and ceiling and value floor and ceiling uh, like with our video on card evaluations uh, that's a mindset that comes from my background in standard and modern and higher power level formats that should be brought down to lower power level because it doesn't make a deck more powerful it makes a deck more consistent and it makes a deck exactly. feel better and work better that's it. Yeah, and at the and at the end of the day, those are the core tenants, uh, or if you will, they're the gears in the machine of magic. Yes, um, all of those things that uh, you know, life is a resource, uh, card advantage, um, tempo plays, and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, those are the nuts and bolts of every format, from pauper all the way up to legacy. Yes, um, it's just a matter of what options are available that defines a format. And coming from a uh, kitchen table background, my first introduction to Magic was a friend of mine and I split a Garuk versus Liliana deck. He had been playing with since he was in elementary school. Uh, and this was in our first year university. So I was about 19 at the time and we split the, the dual decks and we were playing at our kitchen table, quite literally. And my friend, my other roommates kind of came in and said, hey, what's <laughs> this? And all of a sudden we were hooked, uh, had a house of the five of us where we would finish up our schoolwork for the day, make some dinner together, and then spend the evenings just spell slinging around the table. Yeah. And um, that approach to the game um, really solidified me into the archetype of a fourth host, I would say. Right. Is that my favorite thing ever since the, that first Liliana versus Grog pack was the flavor of the game. And as soon as I flipped over my first card to look at the color wheel on the back mm -hmm. and have my friend explain the interactions between all of that, that's when I knew I was hooked for the long term. Okay. It was just all of the different interactions. We started around Zendikar block, um, and then that was uh, quickly followed up by Scarves. Mm -hmm. So I got a great introduction to kind of in Zendikar, 
what the five colors are supposed to be, and then the potential of artifacts. And for me, I kind of went in and out until Rav, uh, the return to Ravnica. And at that point <laughs> was when I went from kind of uh, just kitchen table with maybe one or two decks to, I think at my worst, I had a collection of about 30 different decks. And all um, kitchen table not, decks, not like yeah. not a defined format. These are Precisely. strictly casual kitchen table decks. Exactly. But the idea behind all of them is they all had a theme. And that's what I love so much is um, we actually, we have a bit of a, uh, we call it the library. So as we were cracking packs and realizing that not everyone was going to use everything, we just started pooling all of the chaff and any unused rares into kind of house piles. Mm -hmm. And so part of the hanging out was to dive into that box and see what you can assemble. So I had all of these different flavors and themes. And through that, I was able to find uh, the styles of play that I liked. And it wasn't really until you introduced me to Merfolk and I started interacting with the community there and um, playing modern myself that I actually even began to think about formats at all because standard was never really something that interested me because uh, I had my play group, I had my friends. Mm -hmm. Um, but once I got that taste of modern and saying, oh, here's the box around the possibilities and playing a, uh, depends who you ask, tier three deck in modern, <laughs> um, I have to earn my wins. So really to be competitive against, uh, you know, Wurza and um, whoever's dominating the format right now, Blitz and all of those decks, you have to know what they're capable of mm -hmm. so that you can play around them. And yeah. that got me thinking about uh, the fundamental mechanics of magic and how that all works. Um, but I think the cool thing was, uh, again, as you said, out of necessity with not that many modern events happening, um, I turned to DDH kind of in step with us launching the channel because guess what? I'm, spent, I'm editing two videos a week, um, so I'm soaking up the knowledge. Yeah. But um, it really synthesized both sides. I, it kept the kind of uh, mechanical gameplay aspects of modern, but to me, Commander has this built-in kitchen table vibe, no matter how competitive the power level yeah. uh, table you're sitting at is. Is It's got that ultimate expression that, again, it's why I had those 20 decks, is that I can assemble now a Commander deck that is my fingerprint, my version of Landfall, and uh, I can tune it to the play style I want, to yeah. be less mid-range, more tempo. Um, and that has really set off this whole snowballing effect that's got me and my girlfriend starting out uh, yet another side library to the main <laughs> <one>. <laughs> it, it is a slippery slope. Magic uh, as a game, regardless of format, is just one of those things that you can get lost in so easily. And you, you mentioned one of my favorite things is that decks are like a fingerprint. You can yeah. give 10 people the same commander and get 10 different decks back from people never the same thing twice because everybody takes their own spin on it everybody makes it their own they include their favorites and their entire legacy of their play style and their history of playing magic is indicative of a deck list that they'll give you it's one of the reasons why i love everybody submitting decks to the channel because mm -hmm. i can see unique things that i would never build myself but somebody else says this is me. This is me yeah. in a deck. And you can see their fingerprints all over it. And I absolutely exactly. love it. Exactly. Right. On the, the next question, kind of on that note, yeah. uh, what is your favorite color in Magic? Ooh, uh, this is going to be an easy one to anyone who knows me. <laughs> I am a blue player. Um, I love control Magic. I love dictating the state of play. Mm -hmm. and being able to say nope and <laughs> just uh as as also like the who also gets all those really high 10 mana you know take extra turns or like just shape reality yeah um if i was to be a wizard those are the kind of things i want i want to be able to manipulate the fabric of reality <laughs> yes yes and, and for, from my end um my, my answer really uh, tells you who I am as a player. You mentioned that you were a Vorthos. That's your mm. style of player. I am very Melvin. I'm more yeah. mechanics based than I am flavor based, though I love all of it. Keep that in mind. Um, but I'm, I'm very kind of Johnny Spike when it comes to yeah. gameplay style. So Johnny Spike, Melvin, I'm a nice balance between those. My favorite color is black. 
Uh, and, yeah. and that is because black does everything. Everything mm-hmm. is a resource to black. And I love that yeah. mechanically between the cards in your hand, the cards in your graveyard, your life totals, your creatures, everything is a resource and black is really all or nothing. You're willing to yeah. give up everything that you have in order to get an effect. And that's what I love about the color. Uh, and I, I said it before, you'll find it in videos. I'm a Golgari man. My my preferred color combination is green, black, because it just leans into that even further. Everything exactly. you do is a resource. I love being able yeah. to use my graveyard as a resource, my hand as a resource, my creatures as a resource. And Golgari really leans into that. Exactly. And depending on the day, I find myself oscillating between, is it when I'm feeling a little more spicy? Um, to Demir when I'm feeling a little more ruthless. Uh, but I usually find myself in the Simic camp is where I would say I am yeah. in terms of the growth magic. And uh, they still kind of have that little bit of that control aspect. But right. um, yeah, no love for white on the Commander channel. Imagine uh, that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, hmm, who, who'd have thought? I wonder if there are any hints towards that in some of our videos, right? Right. <laughs> uh, so uh, you, you mentioned that uh, that episode four on the channel uh, is your Azuri deck. Uh, is Azuri your favorite EDH deck? You know what? Um, it was a it was more of an entry point for me. Um, it was really just a way to assemble a deck to get into the playgroup. Um, but as I've been uh, brewing over the past few months, I have recently stumbled on a Yarok list okay. that I have put together. And is incredibly, uh, it, it, it just works mm-hmm. and it utilizes, uh, it's a salt brew. So I get three of my favorite colors and three of my favorite things to do and all the best parts of them. So it's got the best parts of green ramp. It's got the best parts of blue control yeah. and like black resource uh, management and denial. Um, so yeah, I've got the Yarok deck at the moment is my favorite EDH deck. Fantastic. Uh, and and mine personally, it's really hard to choose. Uh, I have literally built hundreds of EDH decks. Yeah. Um, I, I, I mentioned this recently uh, in, in a few places, but uh, my 2019 New Year's resolution, when everybody was playing Magic together, was to never play the same EDH deck twice for the entire year. Uh, now, for some people, that might seem reasonable if you've only got one play group and you only play once a month. But I have three play groups, and one of those play groups plays every week. Uh, two of the play groups play once a month. Uh, so I built a lot of decks last year alone. The total count was up over 60 decks just wow. last year alone. <laughs> and I have deck lists for each one of them. Uh, but uh, I, I think. Uh, in, in recent memory, my favorite deck has to be my competitive deck of choice, it, it, which is uh, Divergent Transformations Kaikar. Uh, okay, it, cool. it, is, uh, it is everything that I love about being a Johnny. Uh, mm-hmm. It is all about a quick combo, but it's got the control elements. I, I mentioned this in our Do a Brew with Jim from the Spike Feeders, but mm-hmm. it's very much the spoiler deck. You sit down as the control deck at the table and your number one goal is just to ensure that nobody else can win at the table. Then you pull out your two card combo to just end the game like that. Uh, When everybody else has spent all of their resources, you turn around and you end the game at instant speed. Uh, And I I love that. Uh, It plays to a lot of my personal philosophies for deck building always have multiple routes to victory, strong mm-hmm. counterplay, strong value. And it's a deck that uh, when you end up seeing me play more high power magic, you'll likely see me play on the channel. It's, it's one of my favorites. But uh, but just this year and since the inception of the channel, my Calamax deck very, very quickly became one of my favorites of all time. Uh, that- I was actually anticipating you saying that one because I've definitely seen it come out as we played some spell table. Yes, um, that it's just like the it, your go-to for having a good time. Yeah, <laughs> and it is uh, all of the tenets of value in an EDH deck just turned up to eleven because exactly. normally the spells in the deck are great value spells, but when you get to double them up or triple them up or quadruple them up, that is <laughs> yeah. just value on top of value on top of value and that resonates really well. 
work with me. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and yeah, the um, the other one I was going to say was you've got your, uh, it's not the Git Run Box, it's your Golgari Brew. Um, with the have, plant token. Oh, uh, Grismold. Uh, Grismold. <laughs> yes. Yeah, the, the Grismold one is probably also up there in terms of like a signature Chris deck. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. The EDH table. And it's because so few people play Grismold. When you sit yeah. down with Grismold as your commander, everybody remembers you as the Grismold player. Uh, but a yeah. few weeks ago, the Grismold deck betrayed me in the <gasps> most terrible of ways. Which, oh, no. uh, which which you might see a video on on someone else's channel coming up soon. Uh, but yeah, there was a, a gruesome betrayal. Uh, Links up here. <laughs> uh, so uh, so Grismold was taken apart for a little bit. He's uh, he's punished okay. and, and is sitting in the library. That's over fair. Here. Having a time time out. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, so uh, so one of the the last questions we're asked is, uh, what are your priorities when you sit down to a game of Commander? And I think that I, I read this question as people asking us, what do you get out of a game of Commander? Or what do you want to get out of a game of Commander? Absolutely. It always depends on the context. And I think that is an important thing to keep in mind for anything to do with Commander. Um, so my main context is the uh, play group of 10 that we would usually sit down to once a month. And with those, that play group, number one goal for me is to ensure that the pace of play continues in a way that everyone's enjoying themselves, especially with larger play groups. Um, you're sitting down to four hours log fest sometimes. And so for me, I bring the decks out that I think is going to give a good challenge, but I'm not necessarily in there to win. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm there to just have a great time with my friends. Um, when I sit down to smaller pods, uh, more competitive ones, um, I'm sitting down to have a good game. Mm -hmm. And I guess that is a very nebulous statement. But to me, th that means that I'm playing on curve and I'm trying to attempt to get my deck to do what it's doing um, while making sure that I am keeping the board uh, in check. But mm -hmm. I lean very much away from um, the kind of spoiler ends of stuff um, because I'm very cognizant of uh, people's time and that if this is the only game they're going to be playing for a month, yeah. then I don't want to just sit down and combo off on turn four or just totally didn't like overwhelm them with resources. Yeah. Unless I'm sure we're having another game. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so for me, it's fun. Yeah. If for me, it's having fun and a good time at the table. Yeah. And I, I mentioned that I've got three different play groups and mm -hmm. Commander really has a different goal for me for all three play groups. Um, yeah. The the first play group is my LGS, where I sit down with a lot of uh, in, enfranchised players as well as a lot of new players. And my number one goal is to show people something cool. If I can be that ambassador for the format to show someone how cool EDH can be, that's what I want to do. And, and people love it when I sit down with a new player and I give them one of my decks and they get to do something cool with one of my decks. I know that hooks are in and that they're going to be an EDH player. Uh, when, yeah. when I play with strangers, when I play with new players, that's my number one goal is to show them how cool this format is. My, my second play group is a smaller group of older friends and that's my more competitive play group. And we're out to win. Uh, and we're constantly one-upping each other and trying to be more competitive and saying, who's taking it home today? Because we get together for a few hours once a month, and our goal is to jam as many games of Magic in a four or five hour span as we can. And we'll play six or seven games of Magic in five hours. Uh, yeah. th that's really the goal with that playgroup. And then there's our playgroup. And our playgroup, I mean, one of my number one goals is to kind of be that font of wisdom for everybody else, for them to say, hey, how do I do better? Hey. You know, this kicked my butt. How can I counterplay in the future? What can I include to get around that? But one of the yeah. things for our play group that I love to do is be arch enemy. Uh, yes, I, I, exactly. I love to be the end <laughs> boss uh, where, you know, I, I'll pull out a deck and I'll do a dozen things. And then everybody's like looking at each other and saying, OK, how do we beat Chris? Now, yeah, uh, there's a very <laughs> defined uh, archetype that uh, our group tends to fall into. And one of the assumptions 
is Chris's got something up his sleeve. <laughs> I recall vividly uh, in 2019 when you were uh, bringing a new deck every month, uh, there was one time you were playing the Locust God. Yes. <laughs> and I had Missouri in a really good position. I had a bunch of experience counters and a big army. And you had, I think, like 15 or 20 things on board. Yeah. And I like looked over for a few minutes and like tried to pick out all the interactions. And I was like, okay, it's safe. And I'm going to be the hero here and take Chris down. <laughs> and I like, I, I missed one card on your board that like undid the entire plan yeah. and just like, you laser beam to be on your next turn. <laughs> yeah, I, I, and and those are the things that I love to do. Whether we're playing four player commander or whether we're doing something big and silly like eight player commander or ten player commander, where we know that we're sitting down and half of our day is going into one game of Magic, uh, is I I like to ensure that while everybody's doing weird things on their own, all of the eyes are on one person so that everybody can be like, okay, we need to strategize, we need to work together. I like being the unifying force at a table. Oh, yes. Uh, and, oh, yeah. and quite often it'll happen that, you know, I won't do something and I'll still be the first taken out at the table because yes. they know, <laughs> they know that I can do something cool. I just haven't gotten there yet, which is yeah. fine by me because I sit back and that's when I review people's deck lists and that's when I put mm -hmm. together advice and uh, that's when, you know, I'll take apart my decks or I'll do something with my decks. And I love it. I love watching it because as soon as I'm removed from the equation, then it's knives out and everybody's exactly. backstabbing each other and everybody's yeah. trying to, to come out on top of that melee. Yeah. In response, I triple bolt you to the face. It's a thing that we have said. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> that, that is a thing that has happened. I have been triple lightning bolted before in, uh, in DH, believe it or not. Um, so, uh, so with all of that, I think one of the biggest questions here, and the last question for our Q and A session right now, is uh, what are the plans for the channel in the future? Uh, and yeah. we we have quite a few things planned uh, for the immediate future and the long term future as well. Exactly. Uh, and so we, yeah, yeah, we've got a we've got a um, bunch of things up our sleeve at the moment. Some of which you're going to see real soon. And uh, some of them that are going to be a little further out, but I think we can we can tease them here today, right? Yeah. Well, I not really a tease, but a warning for everybody. Yeah. Uh, November is a very special month, uh, kind of in in general in uh, in our lives and going to be on the channel. Uh, November is a month that I call November, uh, and November is a day where I do a deck list a day. Uh, I did it last year before the channel even started. I posted one of the deck lists of the many decks that I had built throughout the year a day with a little bit of a breakdown on it. And you're going to see that tradition brought to the channel here as well. So our regular programming is going to be disrupted for the month of November. And you're going to get a video a day from us in the month of November. And that's not just for our benefit. Uh, we're happy to announce that, uh, in the month of November, all proceeds generated by the channel are going to go to Toronto Sick Kids via Extra Life. Uh, all of our Patreon support, all of the donations that we generate and everything else that we do in the month of November is going to go to a good cause. Uh, and we're, we're doing this to ensure that you get some good entertainment and some good deck building ideas and see some sweet brews and it all goes to support a good cause just be easy on us because we're going to be going crazy through the month with oh, the, yeah. a, a deck list a day <laughs> but i'm really excited for it um i think that uh one of the things we talked about early days was just like uh in a big picture for the channel what can we do um outside of the magic community to uh give back and i think when you hit upon that idea of bringing november to the channel um, and then we can marry it with uh, sick kids. Uh, I think that's, it was just the best opportunity. And we want to make this a tradition where uh, one month out of the year, us and hopefully the community watching um, can take a, take a view outside of the, the play table and really bring all that camaraderie and that positive feeling that we have in the space mm -hmm. and let it out into the world. So I'm Absolutely. really pumped for this as a uh, as an annual tradition. And you guys are actually going to hear a little bit from more from me 
uh, because to help Chris, you know, with sleeping at night and whatnot, <laughs> uh, I'm going to be taking over and uh, hosting uh, half the videos for the uh, for the month of November. So you'll be hearing a little bit more from me. Yeah, we'll be trading off narration duties for the month of November. So you'll hear a little bit more from Sean and from myself throughout the month. Uh, but keep in mind, that's 30 deck lists, 30 videos that you'll get from us for the month. So uh, so so keep that in mind. Keep an eye out for it. Uh, and then beyond that, uh, when we hit 2021, uh, we're looking at the next big contest on the channel. Uh, in that's January, right. we want to be kicking off the new year with a way to get more people into the format. So what we're going to be doing is that around January, and we'll make announcements about this, we're going to be running an intro to EDH contest uh, where we'll be giving away a, a monocolored deck of every color. And these are going to be starter decks, so they aren't going to be quite on the scale of the Eurico deck that we gave away, but they're great ways to get somebody into the format. They're great intro decks built by myself that we'll be giving away. So stay tuned because we'll tell you how to enter that when we get closer to January. It'll be a great thing to have in your library such that, um, fingers crossed, when we can go to our LGSs again, you can have it in your deck box and you can be an ambassador at your uh, local game store to get a new player into the format. And makes great gifts as well. Granted, yeah. it's a little belated for the holiday season, but if you're looking to get somebody into the format, whether it be uh, a relative or a loved one or a friend that you want them to try and share this passion with you, this is a great introduction to the format and a great way to say, here's your first deck. You don't need to put any thought into that. And uh, get those hooks in, like we mentioned. Sink those claws in and drag <laughs> them into the format. And once it gets you, it's going to get you for life. <laughs> exactly, exactly. I, I think that as Magic fans, we can all attest that Magic gets its teeth into you and doesn't let go. Absolutely. So we've talked about how we started. We talked about what you guys can expect from us in the future. And I hope you learned a little bit about us here. But uh, what do you say, Chris? Is this... Uh, yeah, I, I think that we've answered uh, we've answered some people's questions. Uh, feel free to uh, let us know in the comments if you uh, if you have any more questions for us. Find us on Twitter at CMDR Mechanic, where I'm happy to answer more questions for you. Submit deck lists to us. You can email us cmdrmechanic at gmail.com. You can message me on Twitter at CMDR Mechanic. You can comment in this or any video. We'll take a look at your questions and your deck lists. And we just want to thank everybody for subscribing, for watching, and for continuing to support us. As I always say, we couldn't do this without you. Very true. Um, All right. Thank you, guys. All right. Um, Thanks, yeah. Sean. And any, any final words? Yeah, um, you guys will be seeing me down in the comments as Among the Crowd. Um, that's uh, That'll be me on YouTube. So if you uh, see me down in the video comments, don't, uh, don't be afraid to say hi. Fantastic. And as always, folks, good luck. Have fun. Have fun. Have fun.